How's it going, everybody? Hey, thank you so much for joining us today for our Continue the Conversation podcast. We believe with all of our hearts that the more we learn about God's Word, the more our hearts expand towards Jesus and our love for Him. And we're excited today. Pastor Mike is back with us. What's going Come on, Pastor on, Mike? Come on, let's lock and load, baby. I'm hanging out with all day, oh, David. Ray. We've literally been hanging out we together. We have. All day today. We, we had a meeting together this morning. This morning. We had lunch together. We ate lunch. And here we are shooting some podcasts. That's together. it. And you're coming to my house tonight, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what time? <laughs> oh, whatever time you want. I man. just need to know what we're eating. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> that is the most important. <laughs> hey, uh, it's so good to be here. And, and you know, this is such an awesome season for our church. Mm. And what we're studying, the book of Revelation. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Here we go. It's going to be so good. And today, I know that we're very excited about the next two episodes today and the next one. Right. That we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. We're going to mm -hmm. be taking some deep dives. We're, mm. we're going to be studying God's Word. And even there's a promise associated with this book. That's right. We were talking about just a moment ago that the Bible says, bless are those who read mm -hmm. and listen to these words. That's right. And we're just believing that for our church. Amen. And as we continue to learn, right. we're believing God's going to expand our hearts for the things of the kingdom. Right, right. And so today, our topic, we're going to be looking at the seven churches, the mm -hmm. letters, the seven letters mm -hmm. that were sent to these churches. Love it. And I, I know there's so much in here. We're mm -hmm. going to actually look at just three of them. Mm -hmm. But before we get to those three, do you mind just giving us a mile-high view of what is, what's happening in these letters? What, what is Jesus saying? Mm -hmm. What's going on here, mm -hmm. Pastor Mike? Well, and uh, to piggyback on what you've said, David, I love that our church is leaning into the book of Revelation. Yeah. Um, I, I know sometimes we can avoid things that we don't fully understand or maybe right. we're intimidated by. Uh, but yes, the Lord said, if you read these words and you listen to them, you'll be blessed. Yes. And so there's going to be a rich blessing, I think, throughout the series and in these podcasts. I, I think God's going to open up our minds and our yep. understandings and deposit things in our hearts hearts that we need today and things that will prepare us for That's tomorrow, good. you good. know? Yeah. And I, I love how Revelation starts out the first couple of chapters, chapters two and three, it's these letters to the church. Mm -hmm. And we are local church guys, yep. man. We, we love the house of God. And, you know, these were real churches that existed in Asia Minor. I right. think in the South, if you were to look at the map of the Southwest portion of Asia Minor. So these were, were seven churches. Now, obviously, you know, in the first century, there were more churches, mm -hmm. but... Th these are the seven churches that Jesus chose. Okay, that's a good point. So you're saying these are not the only seven right, churches right. that exist. Yeah, there's more than seven <laughs> churches in the first century. But he wanted to say something to these seven. Specifically, yes. And, you know, some scholars would think, obviously, the number seven in the Bible is significant. Right. It, it speaks of completion. Mm -hmm. And so some scholars would say that though these are just seven letters to seven churches, it's the complete message for okay. the big church, the yep. big C. And, um, and so within that, there are some specific things that are said to those churches, um, but there's some also some overarching things that apply to all of us. Correct. So, you know, the, these, though they're not all the churches that existed, these are the messages for the church. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and so, um, you know, there are different ways to interpret this. You know, you can interpret it in a literal sense, which okay. I think is a good place to start, you know, because these, these were, if you look at them on a map, you know, I think, and you were to start in the order that it's written, it starts with, with Ephesus, and then it ends with Laodicea, and it kind of goes in a clockwork, okay. in a kind of clockwise That's motion, okay. which is kind of cool. Oh, and you know your maps. Well, hey, I, I don't know about I just read something. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And, and so that, that's kind of interesting, you know, yes. you start with Ephesus and you end with Laodicea and, right. and kind of in, in the order that they're presented to us in chapters two and chapter three. So these are specific letters that were written to real churches um, at a specific time to address circumstances within the church. That's, okay. a, that's a literal way okay. um, to, to interpret. There's also a prophetic you know, aspect to this as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, with those seven churches, some scholars think that you could interpret it in, in terms of dispensations. Okay. 
that there's this thing called the church age, and it started on the day of Pentecost, right? the birth of the New Testament church Thanks in Jerusalem, Acts, Acts chapter 2, and scholars say that we are living in the continuation of that, the, the church age, okay. you know, God's grace is being poured out onto the Gentiles, yep. you know, and so this is the age of the Gentiles, the, the church age, and so scholars believe that these seven letters could be interpreted prophetically through the dispensations of the church okay. age. I wonder if, like, like, was that that clock you're talking about, too? Is that yes? Okay. That's where the clock comes in. Yeah. So you know, the first dispensation would have been Ephesus. This is the time. Yes. Oh tick, man, tick, that's tick. good. You see where we're yeah, going? I like that. So, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, I, I think we got to be careful that we're not reading into things. But I like know. it though. <laughs> 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 but it is it is a, a way to interpret as well. So there's a literal literal interpretation. A there's a prophetic, and then there's the eternal okay. in- interpretation. And this applies to all <clears throat> churches, at all times, in all circumstances. And so, um, not just specifically then and there, but also here and now. Okay. And what will be, you know. So I, I often when I study these letters. I often wonder, okay, Lord, if you were to write a letter to Healing Place Church, mm-hmm. what would that letter contain? Yeah. You know, and the, there's a pattern to these letters, and they, they end with, you know, he that has an ear, let, let him, him hear, hear what the Spirit of right. God is saying to the churches. Right. And so I, I think that there's, a, there's an implication that seems to point that the Spirit himself will reveal to us ah, the so truth yes. that's written in these letters. Yes, and you, you know what's so interesting, too, is in the, the opening chapter, you have this vision that John sees, mm-hmm. as John's the author of right. the book of Revelation, you think about how much John was used Big by time. Jesus. Here's the beloved disciple. The one that Jesus loved. <laughs> I know, wouldn't that be great if that was said about Yeah, you? he wrote that about himself, <laughs> didn't he? Hey, He's like, oh, by the way. Class I'm, favorite right here. I'm that guy. <laughs> 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 I love that. And here he is, he's writing the scriptures. You think, obviously, Paul. Paul wrote 13 epistles. Mm-hmm. And then you have Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. A lot of, a lot mm-hmm. of words, a lot, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of writing there. And then John, the Gospel of John, First and Second, Third John, and then the book of Revelation. And here he is, exile on the Isle of Patmos. He's older. I believe he is the he's the last surviving mm-hmm. disciple. Mm-hmm. He is up in age. I mean, this is but he's still on fire for Jesus. He's been persecuted. Yes, they, they tried, tried to kill him. Try to kill him. Couldn't boil him. try to boil him in oil, and he still wouldn't. Man, die. and here he is seeing this revelation of Jesus. And if you go back for those who are a part of this podcast, go back and read chapter one and mm-hmm. how Jesus is described. Mm-hmm. And and just eyes of fire and and how there is just a robe that's white as wool and his hair and just uh, you know the sword it's just it's just amazing you just see it's just power it's yeah. like whoa this guy's in control yeah you try to visualize what John was seeing right and and even the words you know just scratch the surface right you know, just probably totally overwhelmed and I think he's he's and has a hard time of articulating what exactly he's seeing because it's mm-hmm. so other than it's mm-hmm. so supernatural. Mm-hmm. And here he is, and he starts addressing these churches. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there is a pattern to these. And most of them fall with Jesus. Something describes about Jesus, of of who he is, what he's doing. And then there's like this exhortation, and then oftentimes correction. Right. And then his correction is there. Right. (laughs) That's one thing that is so apparent, is like Jesus is, is loving, but man, if there's something that needs to be addressed... That's right. He's going to address it. Well, it, it, love corrects. That's right. Correction and discipline are a sign of love. Yeah. And because the Lord loves the church. He, yeah. he loved those seven churches. He loves the church today. Right. And because he loves us, he, he brings encouragement, yep. but he also brings correction and That's direction. Right. And of those seven churches, I believe four of them contain both rebuke mm-hmm. and exhortation. Yep. Um, two of them are just Exhortation. Hey, that's our favorite. Man, right we, we're shooting for the two, man. As words of affirmation, people. <laughs> man, sign me up. <laughs> yes, I, I hope I, I hope we fall in that category. Yeah. Um, but and then there's one. There's there's nothing but rebuke. Right. And we're uh, and again, about all of it is a sign of love. And right. so whatever the Lord speaks to the church is something that we need to that's hear. That's right. And I even thought about how you know Jesus. He's more concerned about how we're conforming into His image. Mm-hmm and less about even our own comfort. Mm -hmm. Now, he is comforting, Mm -hmm. but he wants to make sure that conviction is part of our lives. And so today, we're going to look at three of those churches. Yep. We're going to look at Ephesus, we're going to look at Philadelphia, 
and we're going to look at Church of Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And these, each one of these, we, we, we chose these for a specific purpose. But Ephesus, man, this is a booming city, just to quickly set you up here. A booming city is kind of the gateway, which is real interesting, to Asia. And a lot of, a lot of people traveling through it, a port city. They, they had a lot of things going for them as far as just the ingenuity there. They had uh, a stadium for, for gladiators to fight that would be able to seat 30,000 people. Oh, wow. And I know we think, well, Tiger Stadium seats 100. But this is a long time ago. <laughs> 30,000. Think about the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans, if anybody's been there. That seats around 18,000. So 30,000, obviously outdoors, but they, they had a lot happening. And this church that was planted is exploding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is just, you talk about momentum, and then Jesus has some things to say to them, though. And I know that Paul planted this church, that Priscilla and Aquila were part of the planting of that church around 52 AD. Mm -hmm. But I want you to talk to us, so you don't mind, Pastor Mike, what does Jesus have to say to the church in Ephesus, mm -hmm. and what can we take away? Well, let, let's read in, in Revelation 2, uh, starting with that first verse. Uh, the Bible says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, okay. the one who walks among the seven gold lampstand. So like you said, the pattern is, man, we're identifying Jesus. Right. He's the one who walks among the lampstands, mm -hmm. which is super encouraging. Lampstands here represent the churches. Okay. And the Lord is walking among the churches. Um, the Bible says that he holds the seven stars in his right hand. Mm -hmm. Something significant about the right hand of Jesus. The right hand represents authority. That's right. It represents strength. And, you know, it's good to know that Jesus holds the church. Yes. You know, I, I think we could stop right there before we can get to the specifics of Ephesus and see how the Lord himself, he walks among our churches, yep. uh, he yep. holds our churches, yep. and he gives power and authority to the church. That's good. And, you know, the church has endured 2,000 years of dictators, of tyrants, of dynasties and empires, persecution, and yet, you know, here's Jesus, and yeah. he says, I got you. I'm holding you. And um, I think that's important to say. Right. You know, Jesus was arrested. He was beaten. He was tortured. I mean, he was crucified. They buried him in a tomb. They rolled a stone to, to, to cover it up. And yet none of that could hold Jesus down. And if you can't keep Jesus in a tomb, Come on. you can't extinguish the church so from the earth. That's so good. So I, I don't, I don't want to start preaching there, Man, but that's a good statement. it's encouraging for all of us who love the local church. Yes. And uh, so verse two, he says this, I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work. I've seen your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but they're not. You've discovered that they are liars. <laughs> How many know the truth will expose the lies yeah. of the enemy? And then he says, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. And I love that. That's high praise. If you, if you notice what he says, there are four specific things that he speaks to. He says, you got great work ethic. Okay. And, and I, I love that. I think it's important that as, as the church, man, that we roll up our sleeves. That's, That's one right. of the things I love about Healing Place. Absolutely. Man, it's not just in word, but it's in deed, yes. man. It's in our doing that we express our faith. He says, you're working really hard. And then he says, you're patient. Okay. <sighs> That's a big deal, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. I it's mean, huge. The, the patience only comes through trial and struggle. And yep. man, they, they worked hard and they were patient. He says, you were committed to the truth. That's a big word because I know this year our word is freedom. Right. You can't have freedom apart from truth. You got to stay committed to the truth. It's not always convenient. It's not always easy. But when you commit to the truth, yep. I mean, you, you walk in freedom. And then he says, you've persevered. But he says in verse four, I have this complaint against you. Uh oh, You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Mm. And this is where we get the phrase first love. Right. They had an impressive resume, all that they had accomplished, but they had lost something in the process. Mm -hmm. they, they, they drifted away from their first love. And I guess it tells me that, you know, for the church at Ephesus, but then if you want to apply that to, to us today, it can be easy to do a lot of things for God, mm -hmm. but then lose your love right. and connection to Him. That's really good. You know, so activity is not the same as affection. Right. And our churches can be very busy, and that's where we got to be careful that 
in our doing, right. in, in the busyness of the church, that we don't get away from the motivation That's that right. really created all of it. It's a love for God and a love for one another. That's As we said, good. you lost your love really in two, yeah, in two realms. And I think they're, they're connected because when you disconnect from a love for the Lord, it's easy to mistreat people. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, the, Jesus said the greatest yep. commandment. That's all I was about to say. Yeah, is yeah. what? What's the greatest the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. And here they had, for whatever reason, and I'd love to hear thoughts on that, but for whatever reason, they had gotten off track. And then how do you get back on track? But I was thinking, too, as you were sharing, it's like, okay, yeah, you're doing can get you off track if you lose sight of Jesus. But also, it, it, it could happen, too, with, hey, somebody has all the right doctrine, you know, mm. I mean, I, I got my theology lined up, got yes. my doctrine right up. I mean, we want that, right? right and we right. also want right doing. But mm -hmm. in that, if those things start to become God in your life, yeah. what you know or what you do, it's good. then it's not about who Jesus is and what mm -hmm. he's doing on the inside of you. It is so amazing how we can start getting off course mm -hmm. and just keeping that unity with him. So I just ask you, like, how do we keep from losing sight of our first love, what would you speak to that? Or also just piggybacking on that, how do we get back to him? Mm -hmm. You, know, you mm -hmm. mind speaking to that? Yeah, well, a, a couple of things. Let me, let me reach back to one of the things you said that I thought was so important, because we can grow in our doctrine and have good understanding of Scripture, and if we're not careful, you know, then you kind of get inflated with pride. Yeah. And the Apostle Peter, I think, <laughs> reminds us, grow in the grace and and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus yep. Christ. Some people grow in the knowledge of Jesus, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not growing in the grace. <laughs> and I think the more you know about the scriptures, yep. I think your level of grace ought to be equivalent. That's exactly right. And, and so that, that's a big deal. It is easy to drift. One of the things we talk about here, Pastor David, we, we challenge our staff and our leaders, don't turn God into a job. Yep. You know, it's easy sometimes. Some people think, man, if I can just get a job at the church, oh, man. <laughs> Everything's just going to be perfect. Dude, you talk about heaven on earth. I, man, get I, just, to, I get to see Pastor Mike every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, man. You'd be looking for another job real fast. Hey, like, you yeah. are awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a great yeah. staff chemistry. There's a great element here at church. But I think it is a, it's a mistake to say that if... If I can work at a church, my life will be perfect mm -hmm. because it is easy to start with good motivation and then we turn God into a job. Yeah. And what we once did out of passion, mm -hmm. then it just becomes the program. Oh, that's good. It, it, it's easy for desire to drift into duty. The things you did out of love, well, I want to, I want to, I want to, then it becomes, well, I have to, yeah. I have to. I have to. And so, you know, that 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 was the the case here for the church at Ephesus, mm -hmm. and I think that's a real warning sign to every church moving forward that you know, we do things based out of our love for him and we need to grow in our love. I pray that I love Jesus more now than I did last week, that's last good. year. I pray 30 years in ministry. Man, I, I don't want my, my heart to be cold and calloused and bitter toward people because, man, I'm soft yeah. toward the Lord. and my, I want to have a, a, a believing spirit. And, man, what I get to do now, I'm more excited than I was 30 years that's ago. That's good. You know, that's so good. it is easy to lose your first love. Um, the longer we serve him, the more we should love him. I think mm -hmm. you could probably talk about it even comparatively in a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's true. It, it, it's easy to to lose the yeah. The don't let that fire go. No, out, baby. man, you got to keep, keep home, dating. Keep the home fires burning, <laughs> and just as you would invest in your relationship with your spouse, yeah, to keep that vibrant and growing and alive, the same we have to do that that's in our so relationship good. with the Lord. That's so good. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, the Lord is always pursuing us, yeah. and so we're the ones that do the drifting. We do. He he is like he's always wanting to take us from glory to glory and, mm -hmm. and do a work in us and draw us closer to Him. But even today, in in my one year reading, I was I was reading in Second Samuel and about David and how his life got off course so quickly. And I read those things and read about this church, and I don't think, well, how could they? I think, Lord, help me. How easy it is for me. God, yeah. help me. Amen. Help me to stay on course. Help me not to lose sight of what's most important in all of my doing or in studying, whatever it might be. Lord, help my heart to be mm -hmm. so soft to mm -hmm. you. So that's fantastic. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I think, so here, here's what, what Jesus, after he corrects them, I'm thankful that he doesn't just correct, but he also directs. Yes. You know, uh, he says, 
look how far you fall in verse 5, turn back to me That's good. and do the works you did at first. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you want to stay in love, you got to do the first things that you did right. when you fell in love. Right. Go back to what you did at first. He says, if you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Now, notice we, we said how the lampstand represents the different churches. And, and as you described, Ephesus was a prominent growing city, very influential, a lot of commerce, a lot of things happening. And the church was, was very influential in this metropolitan area. We begin to lose our influence mm-hmm. if we get away from our first love. Right. And so I think churches that maintain their influence are the ones who continue to fuel and feed that first love. That's great. He said to repent. So we got to repent and return. Repent. Yes. We got to repent. Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, man. Yeah. I, he said, look how far you've fallen. That's the thing with drifting. You don't realize how far off course you are when slowly, subtly, little by little over time, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and next thing you know, you are miles away right. from your intended purpose. Right. He said, if you don't repent, if you don't return, yeah. then you're going to lose your influence among the churches. That's really good. Yeah, so helpful. So let's go, on, let's go on to the next church. Okay. I mean, that was... That was great. Still more to be even I said. Know, we could even unpack it further. But. but the next church, uh, Philadelphia. Philly. Oh, Philly. The Philly special, man. <laughs> Let's go. Different Philadelphia. Different Philadelphia. But you know what? This this church, there was nothing negative said about them. I mean, how awesome is that? That's great. And it, just that God is just all, it's all positive what Jesus has to say. But yet this church was highly persecuted. Mm-hmm. It, they refer to this as like the little Athens. And if you think about with Greece and, and Athens when Paul pointed out that this this statue or this place, the unknown God, mm-hmm. and he said, let me tell you about this one, because there was all these false gods around. And so here in Philadelphia, a lot of paganism, a lot of idolatry worship, and here this church, Jesus has nothing but great things to say about them, mm-hmm. but they are underneath some heavy, heavy mm-hmm. persecution. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about this church, mm. the brotherly love, baby. That's, that's it. Well, in Revelation 3 is where you find the, the church of Philadelphia. He says in verse 7, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, mm. the one who has the key of David. Again, uh, in similar pattern, it first starts to describe who Jesus is. He walks among the churches. He holds them in his right hand. This one says that that he holds the key of David. Mm. And and come on, David. Hey, here we go, man. David's Where got my some keys, keys, man. Where are your keys at, man? <laughs> the Lord's got them. <laughs> but the thing about keys that's significant, right? Keys give you access. access. Keys will unlock some yes. things. You know, the person who has keys is the one who has authority. <laughs> he can get into spaces and places that other people can't. And and I love that because you know he's the one who holds the keys, right? And our churches have to be built on a love and a commitment to Christ in order to gain access into areas Mm -hmm. that God's called us to reach. Um, You know, when you have keys, you don't have to force doors to open. Yeah. And I know there have been times in my life when I have forced things and I have frustrated things. But when you have keys, you know, it, it makes things effortless. That's really so he, he says, I know all, verse 8, I know all the things that you do. And I've opened a door for you that no one can close. Mm. That's great. The opportunities will always follow people who are committed to Christ because he unlocks things. And I know there are probably people right now that are watching this podcast, maybe listening to it, and they're needing some doors to open. Right. You know, and, and I think the, the way that we find open doors is to seek the one who has the keys. That's right. Um, he says this in the last part of verse 8. He says, you have little strength. Yet you've obeyed my word and did not deny me. I think the it's interesting because he says little strength. Philadelphia was a small community. Hmm. It wasn't booming like Ephesus. Right. You know, it was a it was just a little town and this was a little church. Right. And he says, You have little strength. But the good news is God doesn't need a lot to do a lot. That's good. You know, That's if good. if we go with the little strength that we have, He will give you. The strength that you need. Come on, say that, baby. <laughs> say that. I love it. It's so good. And he says in verse 9, look, I'll force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews, but they're not, 
to come and bow at your feet. Wow. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. Mm. You know, after the destruction of, of the temple in, in, in 70 AD, and when the city of Jerusalem was burned to the ground, there was a huge influx of mm. Jewish refugees that came into Asia Minor, including this little area called Philadelphia. Oh, wow. And so a large number of Jews were converting to Christ. Okay. It's amazing how a church under persecution will persevere and God will use them to bring transformation into a community. So out of crisis came kingdom transformation. The Bible says this in verse 10, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I'll protect you from the great time of testing. Hmm. Now, I know in a future podcast, we're going to talk about the tribulation period. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this could be a little, some scholars believe that this is an indication that the church won't go through the great tribulation. Doesn't mean that they won't suffer persecution right. because of the very They're letter. Suffering it. This yeah. church is going through persecution right now. But he says, I'm going to protect you mm-hmm. from the great time of, of testing. And you know, we've got the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments the and the bowl judgments. <laughs> and when is the rapture? And we'll talk yeah. about all that. Yeah. And you know, that's round two. That's round two. <laughs> that's round two. Um, but he says this to, to the church in Philadelphia I'm coming soon. Oh, yes. So hope. hope. Yes. What hope. I- I'm coming. Yes. And he says, hold on to what you have. Yes. So just hang in there. If you can just persevere. That's right. I'm coming soon. You, you know, I, I was thinking as you're, you're sharing here, I'm thinking, you know, you just the spirit of God just starts speaking to you. And you think, you know, sometimes we relate suffering as an absence of God. Mm. And here, Jesus, talking to this church that's suffering so much, he's like, man, I'm in the midst of you. Mm-hmm. And you have been faithful, mm-hmm. even in light of suffering. Mm-hmm. And I know, in comparably, we don't suffer like like these individuals did, or other churches throughout the world. Right. But we're also we're seeing more and more resistance, right? And it's almost a precursor that hey, we better be prepared, right? We better make sure that we don't like Ephesus lose our first love, right? And that we are committed to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Whether it's good times or difficult times, mm-hmm. the great thing about God and the Lord, He is faithful through it all. Amen. You know, so what would you say in regards to this for people who are going through tough time? How, how do we? How do we make it through? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And and to your point, I think you're spot on. We are living in a culture that is growing in hostility Absolutely. toward the things of God. Absolutely, we don't know persecution like most Christians do. But you can feel the uptick, yeah. in, you know, and and I think it is a sign of the the coming of the Lord. Yeah, uh, and Jesus spoke to his disciples again and again about that. And there, there, there's two things specifically that I want to say as it relates to suffering that that hopefully um, will encourage people today because. God guaranteed that we would suffer. You know, Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will always have tribulation. Right. Um, but he said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Yes. So there's something in the midst of suffering that God wants to use in our lives right. to accomplish his purposes. He told his disciples, he said, listen, they're going to arrest you. They're going to drag you into court. Mm-hmm. Don't even worry about what you're going to say. That's right. Holy Spirit will put the words in your mouth and that will give you that will be your opportunity to tell them about me. And so I thought about that the other day, that persecution, in a sense, can become our pulpit. Mm. Well, Mike, I'm not a pastor. I don't preach. I can't teach. No, no, no. But when you come under persecution, your response to that is a message, not only to those that persecute you, but to those who are watching, saying, how will you respond? He said to his disciples, this is your chance to tell them about me. And so it gives us motivation. It's interesting how Ephesus, they lost their first love. If If we stay crazy, madly in love with Jesus, then we will stand for him in yeah. times of persecution. Right. You know, man, I, I, I love my wife and bless God, I'm going I'm to stand for her. I'm going to defend her. That's right. You know, and, and it's, it's motivated out of a, a love for her. I'm committed. Yes. And because we love the Lord, our commitment to stand even in the face of adversity and persecution. The second thought I, as an example that I had, remember when, when the apostle Paul before, who was Paul, he was Saul, yeah. and he was a great persecutor of the church, right. and just in direct opposition to the things of God. On the road to Damascus, you know, he has this Damascus Road experience, man, he can't see, man, there's radical transformation now, God's changing his heart, and he says, Saul, why do you persecute me? Yeah. 
Well, he didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? That's true. He said, why are you persecuting me? Yeah. Which I think, oh, it's so comforting and so encouraging. When, when we go through hard times, we don't go alone. That's right. He, he identifies with yeah, those who he are suffering, it. with those who are being persecuted. Yes. And what's interesting in, in Acts chapter 9, when God spoke to Ananias, because everybody's afraid of Saul, he was terrorizing the church, and God said, Ananias, no, I want you to go. Saul is my chosen instrument, and he will speak of me before kings, before Gentiles, and before the nation of Israel. Well, how was Paul going to speak of God before kings? Mm-hmm. Through arrest, persecution. Yeah, being arrested. He was arrested. He yeah. was chained. Man, he was on trial. <laughs> that was his persecution. Not, not the was the path I would have chosen. No, man. It's, yeah. uh, sign me up for a conference and speak in this stadium. And man, I want to be. You know, no, you're going to be arrested. And through persecution and suffering, right. the message will go forward. Wow. It's amazing how the sovereignty of God, the plan of the Lord, his presence among it all mm. and in it all. He, he just, he is the master planner. Amen. He works all things together for the good of those who love him. Mm-hmm. This is such good stuff. Last one. Okay. Church and Laodicea. Yeah. Let, let's end with a, with a bang here. Oh, <laughs> this this one. one's a tough one, man. Hey, this one, th- th- you, Laodicea wouldn't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ah. This one you do not want to be because yes. this one's just straight up rebuke. It's tough. There, there is no pat on the back. Keep your chin up. This is, hey, I got some things to say mm-hmm. to you. And interestingly, this church is, this is a very wealthy area. Man, wealth, success, banking industry, which when I was studying that, I was like, that's interesting. I don't know if they think they had crypto, but they had the banking <laughs> industry going. They were famous for fashion. Mm-hmm. Come on. Hey. I know that that's me and you. I wouldn't right fit there. in. No, Where I is? would not fit in, man. I'd have to live. Johnny on would now. That, that, that would. Johnny. He'd probably be the mayor. <laughs> the mayor of Laodicea, man. <laughs> He's looking good, <laughs> as always. <laughs> but th- this place is booming, and they think we're awesome. That's it. We got it going on. Got it going. And on. Jesus comes in, and he says, "Hey, mm-hmm. yeah, it, you don't got it going on. Mm-hmm. I got some things to say to mm-hmm. you. I, I know there's some." Some water that you're going to talk about, the aqueducts that kind of give some context here mm-hmm. that's coming from the springs, coming from the mountains, the valleys. Uh, talk to us about Laodicea. Mm-hmm. What does Jesus have to say to the church there? Well, he, he, he brings it hard in the paint, man. He goes all in from Jump Street. He, he says in, in Revelation 3.15, he says, I know all the things that you do. He knows everything. He sees it all that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Wow. Woo. And you know, I, I have to say this. I have made a mistake in how I have taught this. Mm-hmm. And when, when I was in youth ministry, I'll never forget. I was so proud of this sermon. Dude, I was proud of it. I was so, some of our best sermons are, are not accurate. Oh, man. I need to go back and apologize <laughs> yeah. to all those kids that had to sit through this one. Um, but you know, you, you heard, hey, I'd, I'd rather be hot on fire for be God fire. or just ice cold, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. turn your back on yeah. God. All in or all out. That's right. Bless so God. So what I did is, so hot, I got some of those... Um, well, those like jawbreakers that are really hot. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, little yeah, candies. Yeah. And, and I got, had a bucket of those. And then I had a bucket of like the shaved ice, the cold. Okay. So, you know, I, I had these, these, this hot candy and this, this bucket of, of snowballs, hot or cold. And then I had some spitballs. So, so I said, you're either a fireball or you're a snowball. <laughs> Our God says, I'm going to make you a spitball. And oh, so, man, good. I'm throwing it. And the kids are like, ah. But it was so theologically incorrect (laughs) because, I mean, common sense would say God doesn't want anybody to be ice cold. Right. You know, so I taught that wrong. Um, I think sometimes a casual reading will Mm -hmm. say, oh, okay, but that's not what what the scripture's saying here. Like like you referenced, there was aqueducts that brought water into this city. Right. And I think uh, Hierapolis was the community that brought in the hot water and Colossae was the community that brought in the cold water. And hot water has value. There's a purpose in hot water. It had medicinal purposes. You could clean with it. Um, Cold water has value. Mm -hmm. You know, cold water's refreshing. Um, Tastes nice. It's good to drink. You know, so hot and cold water both have a useful purpose, but lukewarm water had no purpose at all. Right. 
And, and so this was more about purpose and, and the idea that God wants to use us for his okay. purposes. Yeah. It's about being useful. Yeah. And like you said, they, they, they thought they were so wealthy. They thought they were so educated. They thought they were so refined. And they measured their usefulness by external. External, yeah. But Jesus said, I see all that you do. Yep. And it's not necessarily what we do, but it's also why we do it. Motivation. And, yeah, your yeah. motives. And he says, you know what? You're not wealthy. You're, 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 you're not cool, man. You're not whole and strong. You're weak. You're sick. You're, you're, you're poor. You know, I, I'm x-raying all of this. And no, you're not useful at all. Mm. And, you know, God forbid we do all this stuff in the name of God. You know, man, we're doing this in his name, right. but we're not doing it in his power. That's good. And so th this was, I think, the indictment on the church at Laodicea. Right. And it's something how we can fool people, but we sure can't fool God. No. He sees past it all. He He's like, I know that little mask. I know that little trick. He knows right to the heart. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what he speaks to. So let me ask you this, Pastor Mike, in closing. This church, he, he came against them. He had some things to say. Mm -hmm. How do we keep ourselves from becoming lukewarm? Mm -hmm. What do we do? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably similar to Ephesus and how sure. you fuel your first love. Yeah. You know, it's like a fire that you don't want to go out. You have to, you have to feed it. You have to, to fuel it. It takes oxygen. You know, um, there, there's certain intentional things that we have to do to keep our heart aflame with kingdom purpose and, and doing it, you know, out of the right motives. Right. You know, uh, I, I, he tells this church, Laodicea, to be zealous and repent. And, mm -hmm. you know, it takes humility and honesty to repent. Yep. Uh, you know, it takes some real soul searching. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is interesting is at the end of this letter, um, he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. Mm. You know, so he hasn't it, left them. No, he abandoned them. He's knocking. He's knocking. That's good. You think I'm inside? I'm not. But I haven't given up on you. I stand that at the door and awesome. knock. I love Any it. man who hears my voice and opens the door. Mm. That, that's it. It's about when you repent. It's honest evaluation. It's humbling yourself. It's opening up the door of your heart. Mm. You say, Lord, I invite you to come yes. in. Clean up every area of my house. Wow. You know, and so th that's where we get. A great evangelistic opportunity. We talk about Jesus standing at the door and knock. You know, you only knock on the door of your own house if you've been locked out. That's good. Think about it. That's really. I'm good. not knocking on the door of my house. That's you my house. The, you got the key. That's it. You got the key. Get it's that. it's <laughs> your dwelling place, yep. man. It's it, access in and out. You only knock on the door of your house if you've been locked out. Wow. This church had shut Jesus out of it his didn't own even home. Know it. Didn't even know it. And he was on the outside looking in. He says, "Hey, I just, I just love thinking about the grace of Jesus. If, if people knock me out of my house." I'd be going somewhere else. <laughs> I'd say, okay, I'm going to go to a better house. You come stay at my house. Yeah, I'm going to go over there, eat some steak. <laughs> but Jesus stays outside knocking. You mm -hmm. would think their practices would have repositioned him so far away. Now, he was removed, but mm -hmm. he was not far away. He was at the door mm -hmm. knocking. Mm -hmm. And as you shared that, I just thought there might be some people watching or listening to this right now. And if they were honest, maybe... Jesus is not in the house. Hmm. Maybe Jesus is not at the forefront. Maybe they've lost their first love. And what's so amazing about the grace of the Lord is all we have to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Lord, come in. Mm -hmm. Lord, cleanse me. And he doesn't come in pointing fingers. He's already addressed it. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, hey, let's get back on track. Don't you love that about the Lord? Mm -hmm. It's just one confession one to say, Lord, I, I'm missing it. I, I've gotten cold or I, I've got you out of the house. I need you back in. Mm -hmm. and he, he comes right back in. Amen. Amen. And you know, again, going back to what we initially said, if we interpret the letters to these churches in a dispensational mm -hmm. prophetic context, uh -oh. then we're living in Laodicea. Oh, that's, I was afraid you were going to say that. Where, where, okay, we need mm. Jesus back come in on. his house. Yes. And that's my prayer. You know, in the last days, difficult times will come. Paul to told us that in our next podcast. We're going to talk about some of these elements, right. you know, right. end of days. Uh, but the scripture also speaks of a great outpouring of his spirit. Yes. 
And, and my prayer is that at Healing Place Church and at all of our churches, Lord, we welcome you. In. Yes. Lord, we, oh, man, we, we, we need your presence. That's right. We need your power. Yep. We need your purpose. We need your provision. Conviction, Lord, we everything. need you. Yes. Mm. I, I love it. What, what a great way to, to conclude this episode. And I just want to encourage people who have been a part of this, man, share it with somebody. You know, share this with a friend. Share this with a family member. Uh, let's get the word out. And and maybe God's dealing with you. Maybe he's speaking something to you. And I just encourage you, just seek the Lord. Man, seek him first, and we believe with all of our heart he is going to do a great work in us. Bishop, this has been fun, man. Hey, I've enjoyed it, man. Wow, you tore it up, dude. Letters to the churches, baby. Tore it up. I love it. it hey, day. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.